People love to hate on some cars. Hell, I do it too. But are they really that bad or is all this hostility simply unwarranted? Hey guys, Stipe here with my list of the top seven cars that don't deserve the hate they get. Begin. Let's hit it off with the haters favorite, the convertible Volkswagen T-Roc, which is a perfect example of an irrational animosity that one car can get. Check this out. A drop top golf is okay, and so is this, but a mix of the best traits from the two somehow isn't? What? Just because it's a crossover, we must automatically disregard it as a useless off-roader lookalike? A pretend car? A tax on stupid people? Well, this one isn't. The topless T-Rock is a well-equipped, fun little car that, if Top Gear is to be believed, is surprisingly good off-road. And they weren't even testing the all-wheel drive version. Granted, the weighty strengthening in the convertible chassis made the acceleration very sluggish, even with the most potent engines, but it's not like anyone's going to mistake the T-Rock for a sports car, so who cares? And neither will it be mistaken for an unstoppable G-Wagon rival. Not that G's get a lot of extreme terrain driving too. Still. The biggest complaint most guys have with this car is simply being seen in one. Why? It's not masculine enough? Well, that says more about you than about the car. This is an easygoing, elbow on the door kind of vehicle. It's for exploring beaches and meadows, enjoying the sunshine and being part of nature, while also working perfectly well in the urban jungle too. So look at it this way. It's a less capable but easier to live two-door Wrangler. Some might prefer that. Just like how I prefer the 3rd gen MX-5 Miata to the older ones, and that, according to the internet, makes me something of an idiot. Are you stupid or something? How can you like the NC? It's the heaviest one ever! Were your parents... cousins? <sighs> Everyone's acting like 5% more weight suddenly made it a Bentley GTC. This is still far from being a heavy car, and the 100 pounds extra it comes with makes it a much, much better car than the previous two generations ever were. Those were literally tin cans, minimum safety, any other features for that matter, no room for people over six foot tall, and less comfortable than the bed in a Ugandan jail cell. The NC fixed all that. It was bigger and therefore more accommodating. It was better equipped, better refined, with larger, more powerful engines, and for the first time ever, it had a retractable hardtop too. That makes a world of difference. Contrary to older Miatas that used to be nothing but toys, this one could have been used every day and any day of the year, just like a proper car. And for what? For a weight of a 14-year-old girl? Sure, I'll take that deal. The NC, personal opinion here, is also the best looking one. Those bulging wheel arches gave it a wide, mean stance, and the big grin that came with a facelift perfectly sums up the demeanor of the third generation Miata. It's fun. Which is not something that can be said about most EVs, but you know what? That's okay. Not every car is meant to put a smile on your face. This one, for example, is for getting work done. This one is waiting for Putin, and this one is just for driving from point A to point B. That's the most common type of car in the world, and this whole electric revolution is happening because of them. Yes, the instant torque makes EVs very quick, sometimes quicker than most supercars, but the novelty of the relentless acceleration at the expense of the noise seems to be wearing off. How else can you explain headlines like these? And these too. Besides, EVs will save the big engine dramatic cars that we love so much. Check this. On average, a 2021 Corolla emits 120 grams of CO2 per kilometer, which is a lot less than what a V12 Ferrari spews. But there are over a million 2021 Corollas around the world, whereas Ferrari sold less than 1,000 of their V12 models. And so I ask you, which of these two needs to go green? Absolutely right, it's 500 pounds. Once most A to B cars turn electric, having a couple of loud dinosaurs still roam in the streets won't hurt anyone. <laughs> And then maybe, just maybe, the governments will loosen up the emission laws on such low volume production cars. The fact is simple. If you want to stop this from happening, embracing electric cars might be the only way to do so. At number four, we have the Chevy Corvair, a car that supposedly will kill you. Vehicles from the 60s were not as safe as they are today. Shocker, I know. They crumble, they roll over, or even explode. This all inspired some dude named Ralph Nader to write a book in which he criticized the cars of the day and directly blamed the big three for a number of deaths. 
while there was some truth to it, Nader did over-exaggerate the things when he called the Corvair a one-car accident due to its specific handling. You see, the Vare was a rear-engine car, and a budget one at that. GM's goal was to build a cheap and simple Beetle rival, but with more power and more body styles. It was a huge success despite failing miserably at the moose test. Having the mass of a rear engine sloshing from side to side coupled with that swing axle meant that the Corvair would easily flip upside down and use your neck as a crumple zone. Ow! So an anti-roll bar was added just two years later and the sales continued to soar. But then, in 1965, the book comes out, slanders the car, which doesn't even suffer from that issue anymore, and well, that was the end of that. The hate mail started coming in. The sales dropped and the Corvair name was so tainted that it never returned again. Speaking of returns, it's the number three on the list. Hey, I get it. There are many reasons for not liking the new Supra, starting with the fact that it looks nowhere near as imposing as the concept car to the fact that it can't keep up with its old rivals anymore, but most importantly, the fact that it's more BMW than Toyota. And don't give me that. Oh, without this collaboration, the new Supra would have never existed because it wouldn't have been profitable. Bullcrap. You mean to say that Toyota, the richest car company in the world, can't spare some bucks to have a new awesome halo car that would spice up their brand? Please. But none of this means that the new GR Supra is a bad sports car. Disappointing? Yes, but not bad. If we were talking about a compact two-door BMW with a straight six at the front and a mid 300 horses burning their tires at the rear, everyone would their pants. But give it a different name, different body, and suddenly that changes everything? Doesn't make much sense now, does it? Besides, since it came out, there have been some notable upgrades too, like raising the power to near 400 HPs and the option to have a manual training. Plus, there are rumors of the fully-fledged GRMN version. Garumina. Garumina? Garumina version with the M3 engine coming too. Uh. That would shut everyone up for sure. But you know, haters are going to hate, no, no. matter what. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Next up, the Ferrari 400, probably the most hated model in their history. It may look elegant today, but when it first came out, this sharp three-box design was a stark departure from the seductive lines of the 60s. To most, such styling sat about as well as a moldy jalapeno burrito. Ugh. It was also calmer and taller and completely different from any other Fez ever made. But being different brought in some good stuff too. For the first time ever, you could actually enjoy the radio in your Ferrari. There was proper headroom in the back now, and another first, there was an option for the automatic gearbox. That too rubbed many the wrong way. Having a three-speed lazy box in a Ferrari? And worse yet, it came from GM. Ugh! But what everyone seems to be forgetting is that this was a gentleman's car, a V12 Grand Tourer. It was a smooth operator not a racer, so of course you'd want an auto. And by the way, the same GM auto was also used in the Rolls of the day too, so stop thinking that it was bad or something. All this hate, people just didn't get it. And those that did kept buying them for 17 long years. It's the longest running production of any Ferrari model. If it was really that bad, the 400 would have been cut faster than a Jewish PP. And at number one, it's the Chevy SSR. I never understood why this thing got so much flack. When it was first shown as a concept car, people went all crazy about it. It's a retro hot rod pickup like El Camino, but with the styling cues from the 50s and, and the roof goes down too. The heads were literally exploding. Then when Chevy released a nearly identical production model, everyone was like, what were they thinking? What do you mean? It's literally the same thing. And look, I can understand that some people might not like the design. I personally find it very interesting, but I'll admit, it's not for everyone. What I don't get is all the complaints about the performance. The SSR is not a muscle car that you'll line up on the drag strip. It's not a track day car either. It's a toy, like a four-wheel Harley of sorts. You wait for a sunny day and then just drive around aimlessly. The top goes down, the V8 plays the song of its people, and you just enjoy the moment. What would you need a stopwatch for? 
But if you really can't get over it, the later models came with a 400 horsepower Corvette LS2, a manual shifter, and many handling upgrades too. The tuning potential on those is almost limitless. As for me, the only modification that I would do is to make it look like a Diamondback version, and then wait for a wild Stallone to appear. And now, here's three more cars that don't deserve the hate they get. See if you can guess them. Like, subscribe, support on Patreon, the usual stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.